Our second speaker is Roman, a senior machine learning engineer from Exynos. And he's going to talk to us about what's, what's under the hood of these big, uh, so large language models and interfaces like chat GDP. So here we go. Hi, everyone. Should the presentation start somehow by itself, or? Um, there is no AI there. We have some people there. They will Still no AI, start. guys. OK, I'll start without a presentation. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, my name is Roman. I'm going to tell about what is under the hood of such technologies. From what is under the hood? of uh, text technologies, for of chatbots technologies, not only chat GPT. My name is Roman, I'm a machine learning engineer, and today I'm going to talk about the chatbots, about the technologies under the hood of the chatbots, uh, and about generative technologies, and I'm going to cover our experiments with uh, generative technologies in natural language processing, I'm going to be a technical, but not so much, so hope everyone will find something interesting for them. Uh, here on the slide, you can see some basic question about the chatbot, but I'm, I think it's not very good style to answer these questions by one by one. Now, any of you can just ask ChatGPT to answer all these questions. Uh, the thing I was going to say here is that Usually, no, not usually, but basically, chatbots uh, have some business purpose, some some business aims they cover. Uh, it's not it's not an it's not a game. It's not an like entertainment. Businesses use chatbots to cover some business tasks. Yeah, well, uh, the previous decade was quite interesting in terms of natural language processing. It was great improvements in natural language processes technologies from uh, word to work, fast text, some embedding techniques with uh, transformers, announcements, and so on. And in 2020, we saw that OpenAI launched GPT-3, and it was fantastic, but also in 2020, it was a publication about the usage of uh, usage of I forgot the term reinforcement learning. Yeah, of using reinforcement learning to fine tune big language models, and that the thing now ChatGPT was using. They used the technology from 2020 to like fine tune their own model to, to make it so good. But again, all these technologies, all the technologies ChatGPT is based on appeared like in these, in, in the previous decade, yeah. Uh, generally, there are two types of natural language processing technologies applied to chatbots. It is retrieval technologies, uh, the situation when, when we retrieve some information from predefined answers or from some database, and there are generative technologies. The example of generative technologies, of course, is ChatGPT. Firstly, about the retrieval technologies. How it works? Just imagine a simple chatbot you can you can make with Google Dialog Flow or some some same technology. You make some graph of communications. For example, for example, we are serving pizza or we are like company that make pizza, and the user asks like, uh, "Do you serve fish and chips?" And the model, using some deep learning technologies or or maybe some pattern patterns is trying to define whether this question about do you serve fish and chips is similar to the question on the right side or on the left side. And depends on sorry, I'm covering the slide. Uh, and depends on which way is more close to this question, 
then we receive this uh, answer. Just for example, we can assume that do you serve fish and chips is much closer to the question what pizza do you have instead of all other questions we have here. So in this case, we will receive like predefined predefined answer that is in our database. We can offer you two kinds of pizza, pepperoni and margarita. Not very good, but quite well. What else we can do with retrieval technologies? For example, we have a uh, squad task. It's uh, one of natural language processing tasks when we can write any question to some context, some predefined context. context and find answers to these questions in this context, if they appear there. For example, we have context about our pizza, like we can serve two kinds of pizza, pepperoni and margarita, and we have these three types of questions. Just four, four lines of code, and we can uh, have answers uh, using some open source model. We can just download it and use it without this whole things with API like we have in ChatGPT. Uh, and we can have an answer, for example, for the question, uh, what pizza do you serve? And the model find that the answer is pepperoni and margarita from this context. We can do the same stuff and ask, what do you serve? And the answer is pizza. But if we ask again, do you serve fish and chips? The answer will be again, pizza. It's better than the, on the previous slides, but again, it's still not very good. And that is a situation where generative technologies come to us. Uh, the same example about the pizza. We have some context, and we are trying to ask a generative model based on this context, answer the question, question, and give rational. We put our context, we can offer you two kind of pizza, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and based on this context answer, the question, do you serve fish and chips? Give a rationale. First thing I want to mention here is that we still have to find some context to put here. And to find this context, we usually use retrieval technologies. So basically, generative technologies, to be accurate, often use this old, very old retrieval technologies. And we receive the answer. No, fish and chips are not available on the menu. The answer is no. How do you think? What was the model I used here? No, chat GPT. I, was, I hope you answered this question this way, but it was not chat GPT. It was very light very simple flunt 5 model that is also open to, it's open source, you can just download it. It has like 30, no, 700 millions of parameters instead of billions, 100 billions ChatGPT has. But it also do pretty nice things. But how it works? Uh, some people say that ChatGPT is machine learning magic, or I don't know, some, some incredible thing. It's, it's super brain, it's artificial intelligence. But basically what it do, it, 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 it just, the, the problem this model solves is just predicting the next word. The only thing this model do is just read the, all the previous context and define probabilities for all the words it knows to define what word should be next. So that's, that, that's so simple. It just predicts one next word. And doing it several iterations, we receive these generative answers. But ChatGPT is not only one model we have in generative technologies. There are tons of them. It's GPT, PyLM, Llama, and so on, on the coder only models. But there are also full transformer encoder plus decoder models like T5 I showed on the previous slide, like Retro, Blender Bot, and so on. But what's the difference? Just, just a slide about ChatGPT. It, I had to put it here because speaking about generative technologies without ChatGPT would be strange. Uh, yeah, that's the story how we were trying to find the naming for this presentation. 
uh, it was late evening on Monday or some some day in this on this week, and we just asked ChatGPT how to, we can how we can name this presentation. That's the way how ChatGPT helps, but again, it's not so. Okay, I'll show what I mean. Uh, just imagine we are trying to use ChatGPT to work with to work for our Exynos support team. We were trying, for example, to put it like uh, one of support agents to answer the question. Just a basic question: How can I withdraw if my screen is blocked? ChatGPT can't answer this question. Okay, we'll provide a context from our frequently asked questions. You can find the same content on our Help Access page. Uh, if your Skrill account is blocked, please contact support and so on. We, we provide this context to answer. Yeah, well, ChatGPT answers, but it again acts like, like, like virtual assistant, not like a support agent we are trying to make it act like. We, we, we try to also add, like, a, please act like support agent or role as support agent, the same answer. So it gives quite good answer, but again, it's too general and not accurate. Like, it's not, it can't be understood by the, our client, like it's our support agent is answering his question. So yeah, ChatGPT is really good. But sometimes it's not accurate enough in the style or in context. You, I hope all of you heard this, that in ChatGPT make tons of errors in facts and so on. Uh, but again, it's good. But it has a disadvantage. It's really huge model. You can't just download it and run it on your computer. Even if you could download it, you couldn't run it because it's requires tons of resources. But are there any alternatives? Yeah, well, the models I mentioned earlier, like Retro model from DeepMind, or Blender bot from Facebook Meta, uh, both of these models have one, uh, they differ from ChatGPT. ChatGPT is decoder-only model, as I mentioned before. And both of these models, Retro and BlenderBot, use encoder to encode some external content to answer the questions they receive from a client. For example, we can ask something, uh, something uh, communicating with BlenderBot, and he will try to search for this topic you asked in the internet. Also, it, uh, trying, it is trying to remember all your previous communicating, extracting some uh, really important information from your previous communicating with BlenderBot, trying to remember it. And after it receives your new question, it, uh, BlenderBot is trying to remember all the information you, he knows about you, uh, trying to connect to the internet, collect all this information, encode it with encoder, and then the output of encoder goes to the decoder where we receive our answer, the answer to our question. Uh, but ChatGPT even is not only one decoder model. We have Llama and PyLM models that are also really huge and they overperform GPT-3 on several benchmarks. But we always say that these models are huge, they are large and so on. Why, Why do we need these models to be so large? Uh, the simple answer is, uh, I found it on, in one research, that uh, Large models can <laughs> large models uh, can can be learned on some tasks and generalize its knowledge to perform well on the different on the tasks the model didn't train on. For example, these guys found out that somewhere between 
70 billion parameters and 8 billion parameters. Model is, tr is starting to perform well on the data set out of the domain model was trained on. For example, you could train the model to, to, to sell pizza, uh, and it will do it great. But when you will try to ask this model about, I don't know, about spaceships, it will fail because it's too small. But if you train the really large model, it is probable that it will not so fail so, <laughs> it will not make so big fail. Uh, and about the T5 I mentioned before, just an image of some image, uh, that this model was trained on tons of tasks, like answer this question, answer those questions, translate these to these, and so on. Uh, and this model also was fine-tuned by its inventors to follow some instructions, like I showed you before, like gives the rationale to this question. And here you can see the differences between the output of model with different number of parameters. For example, large model with 7 hundred million of parameters, answers like, no, fish and chips are not available on the menu. The answer is no. And the model that had only 300 million parameters answered some strange stuff. But, but the answer, the final answer was no. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I also found this very funny. Uh, knowing all this, we came to our experiments. We were inspired by Google T5 uh, model, by ChatGPT, by BlenderBot, by Retro, and we were trying to make our own model that can perform well in communicating with our customers. Uh, the way it works is like we have some user question, we search some possible answers in our database, uh, we get these results of this search, put it into the encoder, and then Output of encoder goes to decoder, and in the decoder we have both the user question and the generated question answer. Um, you probably may ask why we use encoder plus decoder while ChatGPT is decoder only. Firstly, it seems to be more um, effective in terms of computations, but Overall, all our experiments are still ongoing, so later we will share some information comparing encoder-decoder architecture with decoder only. How we created the data set? We did not uh, hire any annotators or guys who label our data. We just took our dialogues. So no labeling at all. It's like unsupervised. It's, it can be called as unsupervised. We just took user question, user answer, uh, and put to the encoder some semantically similar answers from all the dialogues we have. So we were trying to train model just to follow the concept that we have some, some key information in the encoder, so please read it and try to generate something to answer the question based on the information you have in the encoder. Yeah, it was inspired by Retro. So guys from Retro, from DeepMind, sorry, did the same stuff, but in more clever way. <laughs> okay, without any details. So what we received. We have a question. How can I withdraw if my Skrill account is blocked? We have some context that we can easily find in our database, database with retrieval technologies. And the model generate answer. It acts like exactly like our support agent. And the answer is accurate. You, you can see, like, you can provide us. Uh, sorry, I'm covering part of the screen. My, sorry. So it really works good, but not, again, it's not ChatGPT. It's small model. It has only 3 million parameters. It's not even that T5 large that generated nice answer to the pizza question. Uh, one more advantage. We can easily change our information in database. For example, just imagine we change the second part of this answer to the, like, if account, your account is blocked, you can just withdraw, okay. Uh, just imagine. Uh, and the model can see these changes without any retraining or 
everything. They, the model sees that something changed and generate new and correct answer. Well, coming to the uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. The technology ChatGPT is famous for. Uh, firstly, I saw that uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback is just like a scientific trick to make scientific publication of ChatGPT. But in fact, I tried this reinforcement learning from human feedback, again, technology from 2020, and it performs really great. What we can do? We can score generated answers of the model with some heuristics, with another model, or with, with anything. For example, we can say that we want our model to, be, to, to, to generate short answers. Uh, it's extremely hard to do just training language model, just training or fight union language model the, in the usual way we do, like input, output, both texts. It's, it's impossible, basically. But with reinforcement learning, we can make some rewards and fines to the model to, like, say, if you generate short answer, it's good. If you generate long answer, it's bad. And also we tried, like, uh, let's make it less polite and uh, make some fines for words like kindly, please, and just, just, just for fun. We did it just for fun. Um, so we find our models for the word please. Uh, and that's the result. You remember the answer for, this, for the same question, and it was quite long. It was two sentences. Here we have, uh, yeah, the fine for this model is not the, for the longest of the sentence, but for the number of the sentences it has. Uh, and now, after just five hours of uh, PPO fine-tuning with these very simple heuristics, we receive much smaller answer, and again, it's still correct. But let's ask our small model with three million of parameters trained on financial support texts about pizza. Uh, you can see that it tries to follow some concept but again, it can't generalize enough to answer the question about the pizza. Also, you can find some interesting thing that we, we, we were find, finding our model for the word please. And on the bottom, you can see that the model was trying to not to use the word please because it, it, is, it is negative re reaction for the word please. So it changed it to the well. For me, it was really funny, but okay. Oh. Yeah, that's it. Uh, as I said, we are still in the process of doing all these experiments, and we are going to show the results, because firstly, it is very, uh, it's very promising if we can use much smaller model to cover some business needs. It is, it is gr it's great, okay? In, ter in, terms, in terms of business, it's really great. Also, we are going to cover some of our results comparing this encoder decoder and other stuff so please follow us and uh, and, and stay tuned because gpt4 is already here thank you very much first question yes um, thank you over here. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, some context for my question. In human beings, uh, when there is intelligence testing, there is a good predictor of performance, which is working memory capacity, essentially how, how, much, how many different variables you can operate when doing uh, logical reasoning. And with these transformer models, we can see that ChatGPT, uh, based on third version, for example, it performed to some extent, and it was able to solve um, simple riddles. But now ChatGPT, based on version four, can solve much more complicated riddles, like maybe used to be 70 IQ points, now it's around 110. Um, so the question is about this working memory capacity. As a professional, how do you... Um, expect this working memory capacity as an emergent property to scale further, because we're already bumping against the limits of technology for how large these models are. Do you expect that this AI will, uh, that this property will scale uh, exponentially going on, and so we're just doomed, or we'll just have to wait for technology for microelectronics to develop? Thank you. 
Well, thank you for your question. It's a very complicated question. Uh, yeah, well, uh, about ChatGPT, firstly, for example, it can really remember a lot of things. For example, you can ask ChatGPT with some information about your company, and it will find an answer, because it can remember the web page it visited. It uh, encapsulates all this knowledge in the weights of the model. Uh, yeah, well, but the same, for, for, as for me, it's not a very effective way because uh, worlds change dynamically and we can't retrain our model every day. So we have, we have to have some other uh, database of knowledge and some mechanism to search through this uh, knowledge base. Uh, about the logical reasoning, yeah, I, I, I remember I tested GPT-3 when it was launched and it, uh, it fails some uh, tests. But again, I started with that chatbots are trying to make, to, to do some business and solving logical tasks, seriously. <laughs> Uh, it's not. It's not the aim we created. Chat. We are still not. We are still can't create artificial intelligence. Okay. Uh, we can create assistants. Some. We can. We can make a virtual assistant. It might be really clever, really clever. But again, it's only assistant. Still, uh, about GPT-4. Uh, I would like to answer your question, but. Uh, I do not don't know anything about GPT-4 because they did not <laughs> publish any of their uh, research, so we even don't know how they put all these 32 thousands of tokens into the transformers. How many uh, trees in Amazonka did they burn to to launch it? I, I don't know. Still waiting. <laughs> if you know something, please <laughs> share. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. Hi, my name is Sergei. <clears throat> um, I would like to ask uh, you about the... I have two questions. First, about decoder and encoder. Can you please explain in simple words what is it, how it works, and what is uh, what it's for? Uh, yeah, well, in simple words, uh, encoder hope you heard about the BERT model, uh, model for text classification and so on. Uh, it's only encoder model. What, it, what this model usually does, it's just uh, uh, read some text and make representation for all this text. Like we input some sentence and output some representation of this sentence. Uh, while the decoder have some token in the beginning and trying to predict next word. So uh, generative part is decoder, because it is predicting next word. And the encoder part is trying to encode knowledge to put it to the decoder. Yeah, got it. Thank you. It's really simple. I'm a, a bit stupid in this, so yeah. Uh, and the second question is uh, about parameters. Uh, the same, simple words. Uh, can you explain? What's the difference between 0 0.3, 0, 0 0.7? What is parameters? What does it mean? Uh, again, in simple words, right? Yes, 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 please. Uh, imagine linear regression. Uh. Simple words, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I understand. Uh, yeah, in still. linear regression, you have this. Uh, better zero, better one, and so on, trainable parameters, or analytically finding parameters. You're trying to, uh, to, to make some function to, to find these parameters to get this predictable, predicting power uh, when you're building linear regression. For example, in uh, linear regression, you have better zero, better one, and better three. It's three parameters. But in neural network like ChatGPT, you have uh, hundreds of billions of these betas, something like this. Thank you again. 
Thank you for also for answering questions that are out of the context strictly of this presentation. Uh, thank you for the questions. I think we can start the panel discussion. Give us some seconds to put the chairs here, and let's let's continue. And follow me on Medium. <laughs> <laughs>